Fox News report. Those claims about the dossier are part of an ongoing push by the president's allies, not just to discredit the Mueller investigation, but to effectively incite an ideological purge of federal law enforcement, expelling anyone viewed as disloyal to Donald J. Trump. If the FBI used this dossier in an affidavit in support of a search warrant to spy on the Trump associates, that's a fraud on the court. That's a crime. Look, the president has a strategy, and his his supporters and defenders have a strategy, which is that whatever the FBI and Robert Mueller come up with, they want his core group of supporters to say, doesn't matter, it's not credible. How much of this is real and how much whipped up by the pundits? Trump tells the New York Times the media will actually help him win re-election, that they'll love him, because otherwise their ratings will plunge. What are the chances of that? On this final day of 2017, we look at the media's record in the era of Trump and journalistic blunders and sexual harassment allegations. How much has the press damaged its own credibility? Plus, Facebook admits that too much time on its network, the constant search for likes and thumbs up can be bad for you. Are we overdosing on social media? I'm Howard Kurtz and this is Media Buzz. The president didn't miss a beat after Christmas when in a single tweet he slammed the Robert Mueller investigation, the unverified Russia dossier, and his former opponent, shortly after former CIA officer Buck Sexton appeared on Fox and Friends. What we really want to know is, was the dossier, which as you all are quite aware, was a Clinton-funded opposition research document, the basis for weaponizing the intelligence community against a political campaign as it was happening? President Trump quickly tweeting, wow, Fox and Friends, dossier is bogus. Clinton campaign, DNC, funded dossier. FBI cannot, after all this time, verify claims and dossier of Russia-Trump collusion. FBI tainted, and they used this crooked Hillary pile of garbage as the basis for going after the Trump campaign. But the president sending a rather different message in a half hour or sit down with the New York Times at Mar-a-Lago saying that while the Mueller probe makes the country look very bad and puts the country in a very bad position, he hopes, he still hopes, that he will be treated fairly. Joining me now to analyze the coverage, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist and a Fox News contributor. Kathy Aru, publisher of Catalina Magazine and a former editor at The Washington Post Magazine. And Mara Liason, NPR's national political reporter and a Fox News contributor. Molly, with all these attacks on Robert Mueller by conservative commentators and numerous Republicans, Trump says, oh, I think he'll be fair. What's the takeaway here for journalists? Well, what's interesting is the last couple of weeks or so, we had all this media coverage about how he he was going to fire Mueller, and it was based on nothing but, I think, like a Democrat in Congress said she thought he might nothing do it. Nothing is speculation. And everything that he's saying is contradicting this. Now, I know that he's not necessarily the most consistent person, but that New York Times interview in particular, he was he was uh, emphatic that he didn't see himself getting rid of Bob Mueller. Right. Good point. Uh, Kathy Aru, uh, when uh, in that uh, New York Times interview, the uh, president was asked about whether he would push for the reopening of the Hillary Clinton email investigation. Right. He said, I have absolute right to do yeah. what I want with the Justice Department. What's been the media reaction to that? To, to him saying that? Yeah. Well, I, I think the media is actually educating people on what's going on. In the past, people didn't understand Mueller's position. They didn't understand the power of the president to do these things. So it's almost like a lesson to uh, the, the public. The media is actually educating everyone. This is what could happen. No one understood that Mueller actually was um, at the disposal of the president. The president could do what he wanted with Mueller. But you say so this is what like, could happen. But, this is what could happen. But, but that it, doesn't mean that it will happen. Right, but it's, it's almost like educating the public. They didn't understand who Mueller was. They didn't understand his power what Trump could do. So it's almost educating the, the, the public. So This New York Times interview, Mara, was conducted by Michael Schmidt. Now, he is an investigative reporter who often breaks stories about Mueller and the right. FBI. He happened to be on Mar-a-Lago duty. And pundits, mostly on the left, have been beating him up, saying, well, he didn't press hard, Trump hard enough. He didn't follow up enough. What was your take on the interview? I think he got some news. He did take the approach to Trump which some people call Trump baiting, where you just basically let him talk. Not a lot of follow-ups, but we found out a lot of things. We, again, of course, he talked about no collusion. I think he mentioned that 16 times. But he did show that he's on both sides of the Mueller debate. On the one hand, he said he thinks he's going to be treated fairly. He's not going to fire him. On the other hand, he also praised 
conservative critics in the media and in Congress for going after Mueller and, and as you saw in that tweet, that the FBI is tainted. So both sides of the story there. Mike Schmidt says he didn't know how long he would have because it was impromptu. You know, his goal was to keep the president talking. And the interview did make a lot of news on, also on Korea and China. And I think some pundit, some people think it's like a TV debate. If you don't get in his face and contradict him and challenge him, it's not a real interview. But the point of an interview is to listen information. Now, Molly, there seems to be kind of a ping pong match going on right now where Trump and some conservatives in the media, uh, especially on Fox, ripped the Mueller investigation. And then the left liberal commentators come along and rip those who are ripping Mueller and the FBI saying, how can you possibly criticize law enforcement? Right. And I think more disconcerting, though, is not whether liberal or conservative commentators are weighing in one side or the other, but so many mainstream journalists seem to adopt that same posture that the left is taking. There is no reason why you can't be skeptical of both the president and the Mueller investigation or and the FBI or Department of Justice. And in fact, a good journalist, I think, would be high, much more skeptical about everybody involved. You don't need to take sides. Well, Kathy, uh, on the flip side, you have a number of liberal commentators right. saying, well, you can't agree this early in the program. You sorry, gotta find I'm that. sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it was a great point. Some liberal commentators <laughs> more interested in attacking president's tweets, attacking Fox News, right. than uh, applying some level of scrutiny to what have obviously been missteps right. in the Mueller investigation and by some FBI agents. Right. Well, at the beginning, everyone was pro Mueller. It, was everywhere. it, it seemed both sides were well, pro Mueller. He had an reputation. He is a Republican. Right. I've interviewed Mueller before. Uh, yeah, a great reputation, great interview. Um, just by the book kind of guy. Yes. So you could see how everyone liked him so, so much. But it's funny, that was going to crumble. We all knew. And it was only a matter of time it was going to crumble. So Because it, he is in the Ken, uh, Ken Starr role. Exactly. Which we saw this with Clinton, we saw this with Watergate. Anytime you're in that kind of a role, it becomes political. Yeah, you don't stick to the facts. Even at the beginning, though, people could have been more skeptical. I mean, Mueller and yeah. Comey were both responsible for that botched anthrax investigation, which cost taxpayers so much money, and they went after the wrong guy. And also just because there should have been some indication right at the beginning that a guy guy so close to Comey might not be the best person to investigate. That is a fair point. Now, the New York Times big lengthy story yesterday about George Papadopoulos, and this is the guy who pleaded guilty, who was described as a low-level foreign policy coffee and boy. coffee boy kind of guy. Um, according to this story, he, uh, at a very drunken evening, uh, back in the spring of 2016, uh, told an Australian diplomat, before any of this was public, that uh, Russia had dirt on Hillary in the form of thousands of emails. Now, how much does this change the media narrative? I think what this does is this offers an alternative story about how the investigation got started. You have a lot of uh, Mueller critics saying the FBI used the dossier to begin the investigation to get the FISA warrant. Now this New York Times story is saying no, it was information from an ally, Australia, who said months before any of the, the leaked emails became public through uh, WikiLeaks that Papadopoulos was talking about them and had some kind of knowledge of them, presumably from Russia. I think, you know, this is a great example of where reporters can push back on sources a little bit more. For a year, we've been told that the dossier, dossier, dossier was the centerpiece of the probe. And now that Congress and other people are asking a lot of tough questions of the FBI and Department of Justice about their use of the dossier, now we're getting these leaks. Oh, no, it wasn't that important. It really didn't matter that much. It had nothing to do with the start of the probe. And of course, the big problem with the dossier was not whether it was the only reason why the probe was started. Yeah. It's whether it was used to secure a wiretap against a, a member of the Trump campaign. Yeah. That's what they're so not you're answering. you're a little skeptical that 28-year-old George Papadopoulos was the guy who I, started the ball rolling here? I think it's funny that after a year being told that the dossier was the centerpiece, yeah. that now we're told, no, really, it's George Papadopoulos. I mean, a guy that nobody ever heard of. And in, in, a, in a weird way, it's actually a worse case than saying that the dossier was the launch <laughs> of the probe. This hearsay from a, an Australian source who didn't even report it for months. I mean, it's just there's something very sketchy about this story, and I think that reporters should push back a little well, You know, the other thing about the dossier, the FBI did interview Chris Steele, who was an uh, intelligence it's operative known to them. Former he British was the spy, author yeah. of the dossier. Yeah. And they so, didn't interview George Papadopoulos until February. So right. how could he be the centerpiece? I'm going to pull us out of the weeds here a little bit <laughs> and ask you about the Washington Post story the other day. This is quoting three sources familiar with Trump's strategy as saying the president's legal team plans to target Mike Flynn as a liar if right. he makes accusations against President Trump. Right. Does this kind of smell like a leak from the Trump side? 
right. Well, this is all spin now. It's all about the spin and who's going to get the right spin. So we got the Flynn spin and then we have the media spin. and then So we're not exactly sure. So who's going to win with this spin game right now, the spin cycle? Do you so. think the post was used to send a signal to Flynn that, hey, uh, this could get pretty nasty if you start pointing fingers? Yeah, well, I think it's typical Trump uh, style. So I think um, they're trying to get ahead of this. So we're not quite sure what Flynn is going to say. We're not sure. So it's all the sides are spinning and the media has to figure this out. Who's right? Who's wrong? We've got to but figure out that weird thing. The story waited until the very end to mention that this was like the most basic legal strategy you would use. I mean, right. somebody already pleads guilty fled. to lying. <laughs> you, you impeach right. their credibility. Right. If you right. didn't and do he it, was no matter who you lying. Are. Right. Yeah. Or that Flynn was fired to lie yeah, yeah, yeah. to Mike Pence back in up January. In What's yeah. he going to say? We that's, don't know. That's a fair point. Um, let me also ask you, Molly, uh, as we do this sort of year-end wrap-up thing, that the media on the right and the left, you know, have very different takes, to say the least, about President Trump's uh, 2017. So Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize-winning economist and New York Times columnist, writes the other day, Donald Trump has been every bit as horrible as, ever, as you might have expected, utterly unfit for office. And then he goes on to say that the system, the game is rigged because Trump Trump won the Electoral College, which I think is in the Constitution, and also gerrymandering, which has been going on for centuries. Yeah, Paul Krubin was also the columnist, I believe, who said that the stock market would never recover if Donald Trump were elected president. Yes, and, in fact, and Sarah Sanders called him out for that prediction after Trump's election, saying it was the worst might, prediction of the year. You might want to take a step back from predictions, but just in general, I think you know the media could do a better job of calming down and just covering him without all of this opprobrium and emotion that they seem to bring to well, it. Well, that was an example from the liberal side. So on the conservative side, Ramesh Panuru, a veteran writer at National Review, Kathy right. says the Trump administration has compiled a solid record of accomplishment mm. in its first year, which compares well to many of its predecessors. But then he says it's debatable how much Trump actually contributed. He had less influence over the tax bill than most presidents. Right. And he bears the responsibility for um, Obamacare not being fully repealed. Right, which is true, but you've got right. the media is divided, and, and someone who's dividing it is Trump. And the media on one side doesn't trust Trump at all, and rightfully so. There's so many different things that come out of his mouth, so many different things that are tweeted. So, yeah, you can right, see why they're divided. Even on the right, they're divided which you're as saying, well. look, he's right. accomplished some things more than we might have expected, right. but they're not exactly having completely fallen in love with him. National Review was right. an anti Trump publication. I know, because you just don't know what to trust. The things that come out of his mouth, the media, you know, if you trust them, then you're not seen as doing your job properly because the media has to question so you can't just you can't just say this is the way it is and the media oh okay I mean that's what they're saying you question the president lead story in the Washington Post today Trump delivers on his vow to shrink government and so what I'm finding is that mainstream outlets that have uh, let's just say been very aggressive toward this president are now you know obviously the tax bill passed and it included a repeal of the health care mandate but I'm now saying, well, yeah, he did accomplish some things, even though we've kind of spent the last nine to ten months telling you that he's been an ineffectual president. Well, look, two things can be true at the same time. Somebody can be a divisive president um, with lo historically low approval ratings, but also compiled a pretty solid record of conservative achievements. Any conservative president would have tried to do what Trump did and hopefully succeeded from conservatives point of view, pass a tax bill, put Neil Gorsuch on the court, shrink the federal bureaucracy, deregulate. I mean, those are solid conservative accomplishments. You can't take that away from him. Do you see a grudging acknowledgement in much of the mainstream press that yes, he has getting some of his agenda done. There have been mistakes and missteps, no question about it. I mean, you're absolutely seeing that, and I'm actually somewhat surprised that you are seeing people admit what happened this year, and it's not just those things, stock market, uh, the crushing of ISIS and whatnot. I think that at some point you just have to cover the reality, but it would have been better to cover what was happening at agencies throughout the year rather than wait till the end. Covering the reality, I like that. as a certain ring to it. Let me get a break here. When we come <laughs> back, the president says the media have no choice but to back him for election because their financial success depends on it, really. And later, John Oliver has second thoughts about confronting Dustin Hoffman over harassment allegations. Fake news and dishonest media, but in that New York Times interview, he sees a dramatic turnaround in his coverage in 2020 for reasons of self-interest. Here's his quotes. Another reason I'm going to win another four years is because newspapers, television, all forms of media will tank if I'm not there, because without me, their ratings are going down the tubes. So they basically have to let me win. And eventually, probably six months before the election, they'll be loving me because they're saying, please, please, don't lose Donald Trump, okay? 
In the world, according to Mr. Trump, uh, the media will push him over the finish line because they need him. He's making them money. Well, I think there is an aspect of codependency between the media and the president where they both benefit by attacking each other. A medical analysis. <laughs> and they, they benefit either through ratings or through political power at the expense of their credibility. They both suffer from really low ratings. It's like they can't quit each other. I think there is something to this that. Oh, I've been not saying good. for a couple of years that news organizations, which spend a lot of time attacking President Trump, are making a lot of money of President Trump. Right. So he has given the press a financial boost. So people like you get on more cable segments. <laughs> so you should be grateful. I'm so thankful for President Trump. No, but I think the New York Times rather see him. Um, they they rather be part of the process of having him uh, leave office, just like the Washington Post with uh, Watergate. I think they'd rather have that moment than have Trump stay in office. So you don't agree that the, even though he might be ringing the cash register, I think they, that they that would have more pleasure in having uh, be, being part of his demise than having him continue. So I don't but, believe it. But you know what's so amazing? But that was my favorite quote in the whole interview. Oh, yeah. This is how he sees the world as a media celebrity, as a reality TV celebrity. Ratings are everything. And he, he even said the media will let me win, as if it's up to the media whether he wins or not. Right, although and the tone of the media coverage could be a factor, but I'm, yeah. you know, he's a businessman. I'm yeah, reminded yeah. of when he threatened to pull out of a CNN debate, unless network president right, right, Jeff right. Zucker donated lots and yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. money to charity or to veterans because he says, I'm boosting your advertising yeah, yeah. rates, right? Yeah. Um, but so this does cut, cut to the question of motivation, as Kathy says. So. Let's let's say, look, Trump has been gold for many news organizations. Uh, for example, Fox News is the highest rated cable network for the second straight year. But CNN, MSNBC, record ratings. The failing New York Times, as he calls the paper. Uh, digital subscriptions have been soaring. But would journalists let up just uh, and not try to drump President Trump, drive President Trump out of office just because the companies are making more money? Do they think that way? Yeah, I don't I don't think so. But I do think people need to remember more that media companies are businesses, that they exist to make money, and that, that you know, it's not just all journalism for the sake of good journalism, and that there are very few organizations that just care about journalism, and that all these different things can come into play. NPR is a nonprofit organization, okay. so we don't live and die by the ratings. But remember what Leslie Moonves of CBS said during the campaign? Something like, Trump is bad for America, but he's great for CBS's bottom line. I mean, so th there is an element of that. Did he say, I'm not sure he said bad for America, but he was making the contrast. I think that's, something, that's well, like, okay, then you quoted him correctly. pretty close to that. Okay. You could look that up. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's classic Trump because he's not being subtle here. He's right. saying the media right. have to let me win because if I'm off the scene, you know, who's going to turn, turn, tune into these, you know, endless cable news segments about <laughs> right, some boring right, president? Boring. Um, so he right. does sort of hit a nerve there, but at the same time, that's an argument that might appeal to the corporate suits who run these companies, but, but journalists have invested a lot of their... Um, not just energy, but, uh, you know, it's been for many a kind of a crusade to what they view as exposing his flaws and weaknesses. Exactly, but dare I say that everyone's become much more interesting thanks to Trump, so I don't think we're ever going to have a boring president after this or a boring politician. You're saying I mean, he has raised the bar. He's raised the bar to crazy tweeting. Well, I he, mean, he's there's... made people really interested but in it, governance in, and during... politics. In yeah. Exactly, he's before. taught everyone what an attorney general is. I mean, there was a time people didn't understand what the yeah. term was. People didn't understand what the secretary, or cabinet secretary was. So he's raised the bar. So with the next administration, which probably may not be his, uh, with the next administration, I think it's going to be interesting. Everyone knows now how to be a reality star in the office. The exact Moonves quote was, it may be bad for America, uh, but it's damn America. good for CBS. <laughs> um, but, but is it because he runs the presidency like a reality show? There's always got to be a new twist, a new plot line? Or, and I, I guess the question is, is this all unique to Donald Trump, or has he changed the nature of presidential communication forever? Well, he had that quote a few months ago where he said, tweeting isn't presidential, it's modern day presidential. And I think there is a truth to that. But it's not just that he manipulates people, it's that people allow themselves to be manipulated right. too. I mean, he had a tweet this week about global warming and you could just see everyone in the media just fall for it and, and, and respond to it. And they are there. I, I wonder if the media can quit Donald Trump. They have not shown themselves able to do well, it. Well, maybe yet. he's just trolling the press here and having a good time and right. we're all taking it a little too seriously. But I think every politician after this will do the exact same thing. I mean, remember the old days when Obama wasn't allowed to have a BlackBerry in office? Yeah. Uh, that, those you say the exact same thing. I mean, he may try, but I'm sorry, you know, a, a Marco Rubio, 
uh, or, no. or a uh, I think he's unique. Bernie Sanders is not going to no. be running the presidency. I think, he, I think there are many ways that he's unique. We're going to find out this out when he finally has a, a successor. But um, he believes that dominating the news cycle is the metric of success. There's an adage in show business, leave him wanting more. Yeah. Donald Trump does not believe in that. <laughs> yeah, he, he does not believe he in that. He take a weave off. Yeah, well, yeah. if he's yeah. dominating the news cycle, I think we are sort of willing to be dominated, <laughs> according to the conversation <laughs> Thank here. Thank you, Trump. Mara Elias and <laughs> Kathy Rue, thanks for coming from New York. Mara, Molly, we'll see you later. You. Up next, a former Facebook executive calls out the company for pushing an addictive product. And Mark Zuckerberg's company doesn't totally disagree. Former Facebook vice president, Shamath Palihapitiya, who says he feels tremendous guilt over what he helped create. ...tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. He went on to say that the short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops we've created, such as hearts, likes, thumbs up, are destroying how society works. Joining us now is Shana Glenzer, a technology analyst here in Washington. So this guy says that Facebook and places like it, they breed misinformation, they obliterate civil discourse and cooperation, and Facebook didn't blow it off. Facebook says, well, we've done a lot of research on this. It's a problem. We're trying to use it to uh, improve our product. What, what do you think? I mean, I think it's astonishing that Facebook conceded that it, it's bad for you. The way, the, if you use it a certain way, that, it, that it's bad. I mean, I like the move. I think people are looking for honesty from these social media companies, both in their news feeds and from the companies. And so I think the first, you know, this first step of, uh, of solving the problem is admitting you have it. Uh, so I think it was a good move on Facebook's part. So it has to be like cigarettes. It should come with a warning. This may be addictive. This may be bad for you. This may be bad for society. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're heading that direction. Yeah, well, certainly Facebook's become a very polarizing place, not just this year, but in recent years. And there's an ugliness on it, just as there is on Twitter and elsewhere. But as, as addicting as it is, and, and how addicting is it? You, you're on Facebook a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I find myself, you know, flipping open the app just to see if I have, you know, another new like. And I'm not proud of that, but I, but it, it gets me coming back over and over again, just flipping it open mindlessly. Yeah, I think there are support groups for this. Yeah, okay, but it, it, as, as as polarizing as it can be and people unfriend each other and all of that, um, based on your own experience, is there also a much more positive side to Facebook? How I think it's, there is a lot of redeeming value in Facebook. You know, for me personally, I've been on this quest to try to be honest on Facebook over the last year and a half. Uh, we've had uh, difficulties with pregnancy, and uh, you know, we, one of our sons, our 13-month-old twin sons, has traumatic brain injury, and we have—I've made a conceited effort to share on Facebook. That it's not all coming on TV and and having you know uh, beautiful pictures. That there is hard life you know issues, and that it means because I did that, I now have this massive cheerleading squad on Facebook for my family, and and all these resources have been offered. And I find it really a redeeming you know value. Was well, that hard for you to write about that? Because often people uh, just don't discuss publicly that part of their lives, and obviously this has been something very trying for you. You also have two beautiful babies, so that's great. Uh, was it hard, and, and did you worry about the reaction? I, it, it was uncomfortable. Um, we had a lot of discussions with my, my husband about, you know, are you okay if we share this information? Right. But the feedback has been, you know, Look, no one ever talks about this. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for sharing. You know, we love your little guys. We love you and your family. And and thank you for being honest on here when, you know, it's not just all, you know, happy memories and beautiful photos. All right. Here's the vacation we just came right, back from. Exactly. All right. So in another Facebook uh, bit of news, uh, the company, Mark Zuckerberg's company, has pulled the plug on this effort to label false stories just that, false, saying... It didn't believe, people weren't believing it. In fact, they were more likely to click on it if it had a false label. So Facebook kind of waving the white flag on this. They are. I mean, it was a, a huge red label that said this is a, fa you know, could potentially be a fake news story. And so they took, a, you know, I think it's interesting. They saw the research that it wasn't working. They took a, you know, a step. And now what they will do is they'll show other stories that may help you stay informed that are like the topic that you shared or that you're interested in. Right. But of course, also leaves the place vulnerable to Russian propaganda, other things we saw during the campaign. Yeah. Finally, New York Times and ProPublica, uh, did a story that Facebook is helping companies target uh, help wanted ads, employment ads to, let's say, age groups, people 25 to 36, people under 40, and saying this could discriminate against older workers who never see these ads. It, it's the power of Facebook is this, you know, micro-targeting. I, I think it 
is helpful for companies to be able to say, listen, we only get applicants from 21 to 35 for this position, and so we want to target them with ads that will help to convert more applicants. I think there is value there. You, you can disagree with no, me. No, but, it, yeah, but, but it's discriminatory because if you're a 55, 60-year-old, maybe retrained worker who lost a factory job, you never get a crack at those jobs. I understand why companies want to target mm -hmm. people, but I think it raises troubling questions. There are a lot of questions that having this ability to really micro-target brings up. This is one of them, but I do think the ability to even target to older individuals for other different jobs you know, is an effective mechanism for these companies and one that a value that Facebook adds for them. Spoken like a good marketer. Uh, you know, it's amazing how much Facebook, uh, just how important this company has become in 10 years in terms of sharing your personal yeah. stories, in terms of businesses, and for the media, everybody needing to try to get clicks off of Facebook. It's woven into the fabric of our society now. All right, Shana Glenza, great Thank to see you. you. Thanks very much for coming in. Ahead on Media Buzz. How much of this year's sexual harassment scandals tarnished the media's credibility? But first, look at the blunders of 2017 and what they have done to trust in the press. 2017 was a really bad year for the media, but how deep and how lasting is the damage? I put those troubling questions to our panel. Joining us now, Gail Trotter, a contributor to Daily Caller and The Hill. Ed Henry, Fox's chief national correspondent. And in New York, Jessica Tarloff, senior director at Bustle.com. And Gail, how much credibility have the media lost this year alone? And is much of that distrust among conservatives? Yes, it's been a really tough year for the media and its credibility, 2017. And when you think about an independent investigative journalism, we haven't seen kind of the death of that this past year. The death of it? The death of it. There's and been a lot of stories that have been labeled investigative reporting. Labeled that way, but do they have the evidence and are they all leaning in one particular way? And you ask about how conservatives are reacting to this. You had Bill Buckley for decades talking about how the mainstream media was uh, disinclined to fairly and accurately report conservative policies. And we see the proof of that with high profile mistake after high profile mistake. We will get to some of those high profile mistakes. But Jessica, uh, many on the left not happy with the media either uh, as the Trump presidency no. has played out. Well, this is universal. I would certainly not say that this is the death of investigative reporting. I think that we've seen some major successes, most notably with the stories that came out of Alabama with the women accusing Roy, Roy Moore of sexual harassment and child molestation in one case, two cases, I think, actually. Uh, but certainly the media credibility has taken a hit, and that's happened on both sides of the aisle. I think along with that, government officials have taken a further hit on their credibility as well. And I understand why the public just generally feels like no one is telling them the truth and that they have to find some way to seek that out. That has led to, I think, even more partisanship yeah. with people just going to whatever feels comforting to them. Right. And there's no question that media credibility has suffered mm -hmm. uh, every year, particularly this year. How much of that is President Trump branding what he calls fake news? Uh, and is that applied to stories that are reckless, biased, rushed, or, some, or also stories he doesn't well, like? A big share of it is about President Trump, whether it's fake news or not. I think my point being that he's the lightning rod at the center of this sort of media maelstrom, if you will. Uh, and I think part of the problem for the media right now, writ large, particularly the political journalists, uh, is that there's just such a rush to find anything on him, anything at all. Some legitimate, this special counsel investigation, there have been legitimate scoops, uh, le uh, there's a legitimate investigation there. Uh, but then when you find the lack of credibility at the FBI, the let's get him, the anti Trump text, there are me mainstream media outlets who simply don't cover that. Uh, and then you look at this massive story by Politico in recent days suggesting that the former president, Barack Obama, uh, let Hezbollah off the hook. And people are going to debate what's accurate, what's not about it. But it's a massive piece. The nightly news of the three major networks simply didn't cover it. Gail, you mentioned mistakes, and I don't exclude Fox News here, but CNN had three big ones this year. The most recent one about a WikiLeaks email to Donald Trump Jr. It turned out to be nothing because of the details, uh, the wrong prediction of what James Comey was going to testify as far as President Trump, and then that Anthony Scaramucci story that led to the firing of three staffers, and then ABC's Brian Ross suspended for four weeks over a false story on Mike Flynn. Um, does this just affect the news organizations involved, or does it collectively affect the whole news business? 
Well, if you look at the, how the media has done in the past year, there was a lot of discussion about whether they would take a hit from the president targeting these news mm -hmm. organizations. And yet you see that their ratings are going up and they're drawing a lot more uh, viewers because people are really interested in politics in 2017. So perversely, they're losing their credibility, but at the same time, they're drawing a lot of people who really are caring about this debate and want to understand the policy and the thinking behind the arguments of the time. So it's this like uh, the, this kind of com confusing situation where you have more interest and you have more of an obligation to be objective right. and yet you see that it's less objective. Well, I would argue that every mistake tarnishes all of us, not that everybody's responsible for somebody's flawed or biased reporting, but it does kind of darken yeah. the image. And, and Jessica, there are instances where journalists get the story right, but then they get hammered on social media because people think they don't believe them or they are buying into conspiracy theories or they they just are sort of on the other team, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say that I think that this fake news moniker that the president, as Ed pointed out there, coined himself, is really dangerous to the business of truth, which is what journalism is all about, right? Uncovering things and presenting them fairly. And we know the difference between uh, reporters and opinion journalists. And I think that has gotten a little bit blurred uh, over the last year, certainly since the Trump ascendancy. And to your point about how when there is a mistake, at an ABC, at a CNN, at a Fox, at an MSNBC, wherever it is, it does tarnish the entire industry because it's not like I agree every with poll, that. I agree every with that. poll me... doesn't pull out, oh, how do you feel specifically about this outlet? Right. They talk but, about the news media. But Jessica, the thing is that President Trump didn't coin the phrase fake news. The media coined that. But he about, popularized it. He, no. he yeah. changed it. He took Gail the phrase his. fake news. No, he took it and he like in a jujitsu jiu type move, was able to take it and turn it against the media. So it was something that the media created, and he was able to turn it against the media. He weaponized it, basically. No. Uh, yes. I like that line. Yes. Right, let me jump in here, because it's not just about Donald Trump. The New York Times this year had to retract and apologize for an editorial that blamed Sarah Palin. Yeah. This right. is in the aftermath of the shooting of the, of the congressional Republicans at that baseball field for having incited the shooting in Tucson yeah. that wounded Gabby Giffords and killed other people. Uh, the Times won the lawsuit, but it looked blatantly political. Right. It, it does. And let me connect to both questions because where I agree with Jessica is that where the president has to be careful uh, I think as a member of the media is that um, when there's a story that may or may not be true but it's just that he disagrees with the premise of it and he calls it fake news you can't just call it fake news because you don't like the story if it's genuinely false genuinely fake it's fair game go after it but you're right with the New York Times part of this is just this fervor to get him no matter what with things big and small in that case, Sarah Palin, go after conservatives, big and small. I'll give you a great example. There's this Chiron from CNN floating around from earlier this year that people are making fun of. It says, you know, Trump has two scoops of ice cream, comma, others have one. Okay. Now, that's and not. You don't think that's real news. I, I, well, I'll tell you, I'll put it this way. Actually, I'm going to surprise you. It's not fake news because it's based on a Time Magazine article yes, where they sat down and had dinner. But is However, that worthy? But is that exactly worthy? Exactly. Of that is my point. Yes. Why? It's just like yes. he has two scoops of ice cream, right. so let's make a big deal of it. <laughs> Final data point to punctuate this. Coke. Yeah. Politico poll this year, 46% believe the media fabricate stories about President Trump, but here's the split. 76% of Republicans say yes, 65% of Democrats say no. Thanks very much. Got a, little, got a little noisy there in our New York newsroom. Coming up after Matt Lauer, Charlie Rose, Mark Halpern, and others who lost their jobs over alleged sexual harassment and assault, has that cast a cloud over the news business? And later, CNN's fixation on a white truck that was blocking its view of the president playing golf. Reporting on sexual harassment and misconduct this year, but also been sub the subject of many of those stories. So, Gail Trotter, we have, you know, the firing of Matt Lauer at NBC, Charlie Rose at CBS, Mark Halpert at MSNBC, Bill O'Reilly at Fox, Michael Oreskes at NPR, Tavis Smiley, PBS, I can go on and on, firing or suspension. Do these blacken the reputations of those news organizations, or does it make it seem like all of the media are have a big problem? I think it points to the larger media culture, and it's a question of physician heal thyself. These media companies are um, apparently complicit in some of this and failing to create an environment that's not hostile towards women. And um, I think when you look at this, it, it has implications for the larger media culture.
And Jessica Tarloff, uh, whenever somebody is let go under these circumstances facing these allegations, it, it almost in instantaneously it raises questions about how the news organization handled right. it, who knew, were they complicit, uh, should the action have been taken earlier? Yeah, and what they're going to do afterwards. I mean, the cleanup after this, you know, how swift the firing, it's now gotten to the light, lightning speed. Like what, ha what happened with Matt Lauer, you know, it was at night and then by the morning he was gone. Right. And you heard Savannah Guthrie was saying, you know, we just found out this morning and that's the end of it. Um, I think that how media organizations move on from this is going to be critical. What changes are they making internally? How are they, how do, they do their HR departments work? Um, how women feel in the environment? Um, is all going to be important to how this goes away. But I would say, you know, this is media wide, obviously. I agree with Gail completely about the complicit nature of this in a lot of them. Um, but it's not just us. And it's a, a real societal problem. Right. Now. That's a fair point. I mean, Gail, yeah. uh, some women feel that they couldn't complain. They were uh, on the lower rungs taking on big stars. Others said that they did complain or told people and that nothing happened. And that, of course, became part of the problem. And we also saw this in the Hollywood cases, the Silicon Valley cases, mm -hmm. uh, in cases is on Capitol Hill. Right, and from the legal aspect of it, you see these non-disclosure agreements where the companies are aware of this. Now, they didn't go to courts of law. There wasn't evidence that was presented and seen by a judge or a jury, but certainly the companies who made these settlements that had non-disclosure agreements knew that there were problems, at least potentially problems with these high-profile stars. And, and Gail, uh, excuse me, um, Jessica, so some women now are saying that, you know, while this is overdue and it's an important moment for society and, and the culture has to change in the media, in the workplace of lots of different right. kinds of outfits, that maybe some of this is going too far, that maybe some people's careers are being ruined on the basis of a single allegation, which, are, which the news organizations don't even sometimes feel compelled to share with the public. What's your thought on that? I think it's really frightening, actually, how far this could go, and I, I'm glad that this is a concern. I think in the beginnings of it, there was this kind of frenzy to make sure that we get all the bad guys out. The problem is, this is one of the grayest areas there is. I was down there in D.C. with you on Media Buzz a few weeks ago, where we talked about how preposterous it was that there was a picture of Al Franken next to a picture of Harvey Weinstein, next to a picture of Charlie Rose, next to a picture of whoever else. I mean, these crimes in some cases, and indiscretions, harassment, and other cases, are so unique and we need to find a way to make sure that we can address all of them like that to make sure that we believe women but that we also have due process and that we're acting responsibly the idea that there are careers being destroyed by something that might be flat out false or something that might not be necessary a career ending is something that we have to consider as a society very important distinctions Jessica Tarloff in New York Gail Trotter here thanks very much for joining thanks. us thanks great to be with you up next, CNN investigates the mystery truck that had the nerve, the nerve, to obscure pictures of Donald Trump golfing. And Vanity Fair is really, really sorry that it poked fun at Hillary Clinton. It's like hiding the ball, the mysterious truck in West Palm Beach that was blocking its crew from seeing President Trump play golf. And Molly Hemingway... How big a story was that? Well, for CNN, it was an incredibly big story. It was 33 times that they covered it. And they seemed to think it was of dramatic import that a white truck was blocking their perfect view of the president golfing. And it turns out that the truck uh, belonged to the sheriff's department down there and it claims that it had nothing to do with the fact that the president was playing golf. But, you know, what it is is that the whole Trump golfing situation. He does a lot of golfing. He likes to golf. Uh, has become a big media story, especially this holiday week, and CNN wanted the pictures. And it's not inappropriate to cover that President Trump likes to golf. He does. I mean, he's been at golf courses, his own golf courses, for the equivalent of most weekends of his presidency. That's perfectly legitimate and to cover. And it's fine to point out that he had criticized President Obama for playing lots of golf. But that's what's so funny about yeah. this, is I think a lot of people remember that they didn't like that President Obama would be golfing yeah. during sensitive terror events or whatnot, and they thought that that was a problem. That didn't receive a lot of media coverage, but now, because it's President Trump, we get a ton of media coverage of this. Yeah, and just to be clear, I have no problem with President Trump playing as much golf as he wants. President is always on duty. I have no problem with Barack Obama playing golf, but it does seem like it's lately become a kind of a thing, well, a meme. And, and, you know, I don't even think this needed to be covered once but certainly not 33 times, and certainly not when there were so many more important stories. I think people want many news outlets to be covering hard news. There was a lot that they could be covering this week. All right, Molly Hemingway, great to see you. Happy New Year. To you, too. Great to see you this Sunday. 
Vanity Fair was buried under a landslide of liberal outrage over this short video suggesting a few New Year's resolutions for Hillary Clinton. Hobby in the New Year. Volunteer work, knitting, improv comedy, literally anything that'll keep you from running again. Knitting, a little satire from the usually anti-Trump magazine, but the anger on the left was so intense that a spokesman actually apologized. It was an attempt at humor, and we regret that it missed the mark. The president saw his opening, Vanity Fair, he tweeted, which looks like it's on its last legs, is bending over backwards and apologizing for the minor hit they took at Crooked H. Tover, total overreaction by Vanity Fair. Trump also taking a swipe at Anna Wintour, who's the editor of Vogue, not Vanity Fair, but is a major player at their parent company, Condé Nast. I have a real problem with the Salt Lake Tribune's editorial urging Senator Orrin Hatch not to run for election. Now, it's fair to point out that Utah Republican is 83, and he did say this would be his last term, a message its author pushed on MSNBC. Resting on his laurels, he thinks this seat belongs to him rather than to the people of Utah. But the Tribune pretended it was mainly about process, saying Hatch is trying to freeze the field to block any credible challengers, which, well, every politician tries to do. And that this is a theft, a theft to satisfy, quote, his unquenchable thirst for power, also known as politics. Hatch's spokesman offered a sly reply, saying he hopes the editors find joy this holiday season beyond baselessly attacking a highly effective lawmaker just to satisfy their unquenchable thirst for clicks. But it turns out it's really about partisan differences. The editorial slammed the Finance Committee chairman's role in passing tax reform and backing a president who shrunk two national monuments. So if Orrin Hatch has been such a terrible senator, why doesn't the paper let the voters decide whether to send him packing? Now, you know how lots of pundits thought this gift for the Treasury Secretary was such a cute item? Questioning someone in connection with uh, an interesting Christmas present for Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, the card